Good afternoon, respected judges and the audience. First of all, I thank the organizers for allowing me to speak. The topic of my discussion is iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. So, the outline of my presentation will be somewhat like this. I will first describe anemia followed by what is iron deficiency anemia and what is iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. So, let us first start with the first topic. What is anemia? In different countries and in different guidelines, there are various definitions of anemia. That is why I have chosen the WHO definition. According to the WHO, anemia, the hemoglobin cutoffs have been defined according to age and gender. So, the only thing to note here is in women, the cutoff for anemia is usually 12. But if it is post menopausal, then the cutoff is equal to adult male, that is 13. However, there are a lot of caveats in this definition of anemia. Firstly, all of these have been defined at sea level. So, according to altitude, the hemoglobin cutoff for anemia will vary. Just to give you a glimpse of this, up to 1000 meters, there is no change of hemoglobin cutoff from sea level. But after 1000 meters, that for every 500 meters, the hemoglobin cutoff for anemia changes. This is important because India is the country with the highest number of people living at high altitude. So in India, a lot of doctors are going to treat people who are born in the hills and who are living in the hilly states. And the cutoff for hemoglobin for those people will be different from the cutoff at sea level. Also, people in the sea level who stay at high altitude for a long time will have the hemoglobin levels rising. But what is prolonged exposure? Usually it is expected that anyone staying for more than 5 years continuously at high altitude will have the hemoglobin cutoff similar to the high altitude population. This is mainly important for the military personnel who are living in Kashmir or Siachen. Also other confounding factors like smoking or alcoholism affects the hemoglobin cutoff for anemia. So after defining anemia, let us go to iron deficiency anemia. Uh, iron deficiency, not anemia, iron deficiency is defined according to the serum ferritin level. The cutoff has been decided to be 15 for both male and female. In some books, it is written as 12, but standard WHO documents say it is 15. But there are also confounding factors. For example, if the patient has chronic inflammation or chronic infection, ferritin cannot be used to define iron deficiency anemia. In those cases, we have to use other markers like red cell indices, serum iron, transferrin saturation and the gold standard is bone marrow staining for iron stores. But for practical purpose, no hematologist is going to do a bone marrow study to diagnose iron deficiency anemia. So what is the sequence of changes of various blood parameters in iron deficiency anemia? The first change of course is serum ferritin and depletion of bone marrow iron stores. Of course, if there is no chronic infection. Second change is a reactionary increase in soluble transferrin receptor and a fall in transferrin saturation. Third, the RBCs become hypochromic that is MCH falls and then they become microcytic that is MCV falls. And finally, there is the fall in hemoglobin. So, if a patient has anemia, it means that iron deficiency has been present for quite a long time before hemoglobin falls. Now the question of course arises is whether we should treat a patient who only has low ferritin but hemoglobin is normal. That is iron deficiency without anemia. This is a burning topic in hematology today. Should it be treated? There is no consensus, it is a debatable issue but it is said that only iron deficiency without anemia can give rise to certain clinical features like decrease in school performance, loss of memory, glossitis and non-specific body aches. Like subclinical hypothyroidism, it is often difficult to decide whether only iron deficiency without anemia should be treated. But probably it should be treated if these clinical features are present. And as is written in the slide, there are certain other factors like increased red cell distribution width and increased in platelets, which also indicate iron deficiency anemia. 
there are certain newer indices which can be used like percentage of hypochromic red cells. This is done by a hematologist from a slide, not by automated cell counter. Reticulocyte hemoglobin concentration, this is also used and of course soluble transferrin receptor which I have mentioned. Just one caveat, mainly for the postgraduates here, if a patient has received recent blood transfusion, then the serum iron profile becomes unreliable. Especially serum iron and transferrin saturation should not be tested if the patient has received blood transfusion in the recent past. But generally, serum ferritin is not affected by recent blood transfusion. Okay? So, transferrin saturation is an important index to uh, diagnose iron deficiency, especially if there is chronic infection when serum ferritin cannot be tested. But serum transferrin saturation is a calculated index. It is serum iron by TIBC into 100. So if serum iron is not estimated properly, transferrin saturation will also be wrong. So what are the caveats before we test serum iron? Uh, Please remember it's a fasting sample, but the fasting should be around 8 hours. It has been found that prolonged fasting more than 12 hours again falsely elevates serum iron. The patient should not be taking any iron or vitamin C supplement for at least 3 days and patients on OCP will have a false high value of serum iron. These are the caveats which must be remembered before we send a blood sample for serum iron testing. So we have diagnosed iron deficiency anemia and we are going to treat the person either with oral or parenteral iron. Oral iron, the dose is 3 mg per kg per day which roughly comes to 60 mg of elemental iron thrice daily. Please remember it is like chloroquine, we measure uh, the dosage according to elemental iron, not according to the weight of the total iron salt. Only 10% of the oral iron will be absorbed. There are a lot of GI side effects which we know and this is how we calculate the iron deficit in a person. With this calculation we add 1000 mg for stores. So what is iron refractory anemia? Generally it is defined as if after giving oral iron, hemoglobin does not rise by at least one percentage point within one month, it is considered as iron refractory anemia provided the patient is compliant to therapy and GI disorders have been ruled out. So iron refractory iron deficiency anemia, there are two ways of defining it. One is a generic term when the patient is refractory to oral iron. Please remember not parenteral iron. If someone is refractory to oral iron, it is called irida. Also it signifies one specific genetic disease. If you do a Google search with irida, you will find this genetic disease. I will describe it in brief later. So just to recap a bit about iron metabolism in the body, we have to remember that in human body, iron is regulated at the point of entry. Unlike sodium or potassium, there is no defined mechanism of iron excretion from the body. The only way of regulating body iron stores is at the point of entry. So the, all the pathologies of iron metabolism, they are regulated at the point of entry like DMT or ferroportin or hepahestin. And the most important hormone in this pathway is hepcidin, which basically down regulates the body iron concentration by decreasing entry of iron from duodenum and also preventing release of iron from the macrophage system. So this is what I was telling you about the genetic variety of iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. TMPRSS is a gene located on chromosome 22 and it down regulates hepcidin hormone in our body. So when there is mutation of this gene, there is increase of hepcidin and when hepcidin is increased, iron absorption from the GI tract is down regulated. So naturally, this patient will have low body iron and if we give oral iron, this will not help because there is high hepcidin and the iron in the food will be stored in the enterocytes and lost through stool. It will not enter the blood. However, like any genetic disease, there are nuances in the mutation. So, it has been found that although theoretically oral iron should not work, but practically in some cases, a trial of ferrous sulphate and vitamin C can help and we should give a trial for up to two months before deciding on the parenteral iron therapy. Gene testing is the, of course the gold standard for diagnosing this, but in our country, 
gene testing is not available in 99% of the centers. A surrogate marker for this may be serum hepcidin level. If serum hepcidin is very high, we can assume it to be a case of iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. There are other genetic mutations which are also responsible. Uh, these are very rare, like DMT1 mutation. It is found in around 20 cases, till now have been reported all over the world in English literature. And uh, very rarely there may be other mutations also, like this mutation. In this mutation, the erythroblasts have lost the capacity to absorb iron from transferrin in blood. So whether we give oral iron or parenteral iron, these patients will not have relief of anemia and this will be transfusion dependent. So this is a variety of transfusion dependent iron deficiency anemia. So lastly, for the last three minutes, I will describe the algorithm how to approach a case of iron deficiency anemia. So first of all, there should be microcytic hypochromic anemia defined according to age and gender specific cutoffs. Then we have to look at the reticulocyte count and the red cell distribution width. If RDW is high, it is likely to be iron deficiency anemia. If it is normal, it's likely to be a thalassemia trait, especially in India and the Middle East. If we think this may be a case of thalassemia, we should go for HPLC. But please remember this part of the algorithm. Please remember that iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia trait can occur together. If this occurs, then the iron deficiency will falsely lower the HbA2 level and the HPLC level will be false negative. So if someone suspects that a person has iron deficiency anemia along with beta thalassemia, first the iron deficiency should be corrected and then only hemoglobin electrophoresis should be done. Otherwise the beta thalassemia carrier state will be missed. If we have done the HPLC and we find there is no thalassemia, we can give a trial of oral iron. But again there is a caveat. Please remember that all of the hemoglobin electrophoresis that we do in India are just to diagnose beta thalassemia. Alpha thalassemia is not diagnosed by hemoglobin electrophoresis. Unless we do a genetic study, there is no way of diagnosing alpha thalassemia. In India, there is no definite study, but it is assumed that a lot of cases of microcytic anemia in India may be due to alpha thalassemia carrier state which are not diagnosed. So, that is one caveat we, we should remember that we have a handicap of diagnosing alpha thalassemia in our patients. So if we find that there is a HPLC is negative, we can go for a trial of oral iron and if the hemoglobin rises by one month, we are happy. If a patient has chronic inflammation, we should uh, check for the chronic inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. If it's not there, we can do an iron profile and we should check for the various GI pathologies which can cause a uh, hindrance to oral iron absorption like celiac disease or H. pylori infection. If there is problem with compliance then we should change the oral iron formulation from let's say ferrous sulphate to fumarate before labeling the case as iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. Now, if it's typical iron deficiency, the oral iron formulation has been changed and the patient has responded, then it's iron deficiency. If it's not, we label the case as unexplained refractory iron deficiency anemia. Very rare, difficult to treat. If we can do a serum hepcidin level, we can do a genetic mutation study, then we can label the case as irida phenotype. And finally, the last part is, when everything else has been excluded, we can check for all the very rare mutations like uh, air transfer anemia, DMT1 mutation like that. So that is how we approach a case of iron deficiency anemia and iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. So before I end, there is just one point I want to mention. Kulekhara is one of the most favorite topics of journalists and other intellectuals in our country. They often promote the fact that if we promote Kulekhara, all iron deficiency in our country are going to go away. There was a, yes, just 15 seconds. This is the last slide. So there was a recent study from Calcutta University where they estimated the actual iron level of Kulekhara leaves and other common leaves which are taken as vegetables in India. In it, it is found that Ipomia is Kolmishak, 
spinosis palongsa kulekhara. We have found that yes, kulekhara contains some amount of iron, but for every 100 gram of kulekhara, there is 7 milligram of iron. So if we take 1 kg of kulekhara leaf, it will be 70 milligram of iron and it's oral, that means only 10% of it will be absorbed. So the next time if anyone asks you, your patient, that whether or if you go to television and the journalist asks you whether Kulekhara is good to solve the problem of iron deficiency anemia in India, you can say that if the patient can take 2 kg of Kulekhara per day, probably iron deficiency can be solved, otherwise not. So thank you. I will just leave you with just one food of thought that is, this you can look up. In America and in European countries, iron is fortified in the food and it is safe. But in malaria endemic countries like India, it is detrimental to fortify our food like baby food or conflicts with iron because the malaria parasite is siderophilic. If we give excess iron to people non-discriminately, then the malaria parasite siderophilic can flare up and there may be complicated malaria. So iron refractory iron deficiency anemia is difficult to treat in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dujit.